Welcome back to the Argyle HR Technology Leadership Forum. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. Now without any further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Today, our moderator is Loretta Siggers, who is Vice President of Human Resources and Talent Development at Cambridge College. We're excited to have Loretta and our panelists for a panel discussion called Global Teams That Work. Welcome, Loretta, and welcome, panelists. Over to you. Thank you, Eric, and it's, I'm excited to be here today. Again, my name is Loretta Siggers. And I'm going to ask the team here if they'd like to introduce themselves. And so I'm going to start off with Tracy. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tracy Tiska. I'm at McGraw-Hill. I am currently the VP of Business HR for our international and global professional groups. And I also wear a second hat here as uh, an employment lawyer at the company. Thank you. Mohammed. Thank you, Loretta, and hi, everyone. Mohammed Ali, a Senior Vice President here at Dow Jones for our People of Business Partners globally. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm going to go next with John. Hi, my name is John Tice, and so glad to be a part of this event. Uh, I serve as the Global Vice President for IMI, which stands for Indiana Mills and Manufacturing Incorporated, but we call it IMI as we expand it around the world. We have four locations outside of the U.S. and four inside of the U.S., but home base is Indiana. Great. Thank you, John. And Dev. Hello, everyone. My name is Dev Das. I work with Globalization Partners, where I am the vice president responsible for all of our customer delivery operations globally. Great. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and I'm going to start out our first question. And we're going to start out with Tracy answering this question first. The first question is, misunderstandings are inevitable. Uh, inevitable in a multinational, multicultural team. How do you handle them and prevent small misunderstandings from becoming big ones? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that misunderstandings are inevitable when you're dealing with global teams. And I sort of learned that the hard way um, early in, in this job when I took on having a global team. I, you know, I learned that even a gesture you know, in one culture can be, you know, mean something different than what it means to me. So what I, you know, quickly realized I needed to do was just make sure, you know, in a casual sort of non patronizing way, make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to substantive conversations that I would be having with my team around the world. So I really got into the habit of just you know, just that quick follow up email, you know, hey, so and so just wanted to confirm, you know, what we discussed, you know, we'll take it from there or whatever. And I, you know, I found that that was, it didn't take that much time, but the benefit to me and also to who I was working with was tremendous because we could clear up any misunderstanding pretty quickly. Um, so I have found that that's been a great tool for me that I have used since I started in this role. Thank you, Tracy. Deb, what about you? What's what's interesting in sort of our global workplace today is that even if you're dealing with one or two countries, you likely do have a multinational, multicultural team. And so what I found is to just start at the offset with what are our team expectations and team norms, because that can really underpin how we think about treating, communicating with each other, and what are those expectations. And it's worthwhile laying that out, especially when you have a group of people working together who will be working together with some frequency over a period of time um, and will be getting into these sorts of topics where you know, misunderstandings can surface. Great. Mohammed, do you have anything to add? Uh, absolutely. So similar to Tracy, I have a very um, interesting story, which uh, you know, ties into a little bit of work-life balance. But you know, leading a global team, you know, there are many, many cultural differences. And similar to what Dev said, even if it's one or two, um, you know, there's a lot of things that could go unsaid uh, within cultural norms. So it's really imperative to, to over communicate, even if it makes either side uncomfortable. Um, so, for instance, I at one point at one point in my career, I, I remember this vividly. I was leading an APAC team. And uh, given the time differences, I, I started realizing early on that they were uh, really leaning towards like our time here in the U.S. So 
Um, it would be their nighttime, but it's our morning time. I tried to flip that and, and, and have some evening uh, meetings uh, to be respectful to them. Um, and then, so when I checked in, I wanted to, to, to really open up the dialogue and ask the team, well, how, how is it going? And to my surprise, they didn't like it. It really, um, it really messed up their work-life balance. They were accustomed to doing the meetings in the evening. And so throughout the day, they were, be, they were able to either spend time with their family or do what they needed to do. Um, so they preferred um, those meetings. And here I am just trying to change something that I thought was better for them. If I hadn't spoken up, I, I really could have thrown off the dynamic of this working team. So uh, glad that I spoke up. And I think that's the key is speaking up. Great example, Muhammad. John, what about you? Uh, two things that I would just add to the already great comments. And one is that is in regular times of when we have global meetings and we have multiple sites and, and most of them are in a remote context, uh, we will just ask the question as a very, just like we did in the introductory say, hey, tell us something unique that's going on in your, where you're at and what that means to you, whether it's a holiday or something about that. So just creating that sense of understanding each other's culture. And, and then the other thing as a byproduct of that, if somebody uses a phrase or something like that, uh, that's new to you, uh, it, just to say everyone, hey, what's that mean? Or how does that, uh, you know, what's that maybe mean in your culture to even, uh, uh, Tracy talked about signs, or we could use words that may be offensive in one culture that aren't in another. And so I think it's easy for us to, to, to get into those things. I think those relational uh, dynamics then make for easier communication. The last thing is simply to follow up, right? I mean, written follow up that goes in and says, hey, here's what I thought we all said. If there's something that's unclear that we're recording, so having someone who's your note taker then shares that with all and clarifies what was done or said or action items in the meeting uh, uh, or event. So those are the my, my couple of takeaways. Great. So if you didn't hear the themes, it was communication, follow-up, and maybe even a written note. That's great. Good, good, good answers here. All right, let's start with our next question. How do you stay on top of, oh, I, no, that's right. How do you stay on top of tax and HR compliance issues when you're managing a global team? And I'm going to start out with Deb on this question. Sure, this is, uh, this is something I'm sure that we're all grappling with, and it's only going to become more more difficult over time as different countries are, are taking a long, harder look at regulatory issues, especially in the HR lens. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take two examples of two very different approaches I've taken at, at, at different companies, but what sort of underpins this is really getting a good sense of the maturity and the roles and responsibilities of the other partner organizations in the company that you're working at. You know, for instance, in, in one organization I was working at, legal and compliance said, you know what, we provide a very umbrella approach across the company, we provide frameworks, but we really rely on the business units to understand and keep the inventory of what needs to be um, complied with, how we're and whether we're in regulatory compliance in different regions around the world. And there, what I had was I had regional and local compliance officers that were working with local counsel to understand what's the inventory of all of the rules and the requirements and the laws, and then are we in operational compliance? So that's one example at one end of the spectrum. What I've also worked with is legal and compliance teams that say, you know, we, we have the local knowledge, we are very well entrenched locally in the countries we operate in, we will keep that master inventory, but rely on your team to ensure operational compliance. So I think in, in summary, this is, this is a massively important area. It's only gonna get more complicated. The critical things I've done is really understand from the stakeholder teams, who's doing what, make sure that's documented and then drive to execution. Great. Mohammed, what about you? What yeah, I would say the, on the, the uh, second part that Dev said, it's really hiring the expertise um, in either area, whether it's HR or tax, um, because regulations are changing, um, you know, by the day and they have to stay on top of it and a foot of it. And then the execution can be handled by, um, you know, whether it's 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 the operational team or, you know, depending on, on how it's set up within your organization, but you have to get the expertise. You can't rely on that being a, a skill set that you can either, um, you know, just home grow. Um, you have to have somebody who is passionate in that area that wants to stay a foot on it and 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 continuously, um, you know, 
educating not only themselves, but also the broader organization. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything else to add? Tracy, John? Yeah, one thing that I'll add is I have uh, taken advantage of um, kind of the free bulletins that a number of global law firms will send out. I just try to get on as many mailing lists as I can, right, so that I can see what's going on because, you know, a number of firms will highlight in, you know, in some of the major countries, you know, major changes. That's one way I can just kind of stay on top of it myself outside of the formal process we here, have here at McGraw-Hill. The other thing that I've done is, you know, use my relationships within the company just to, you know, reach out every once in a while to somebody in finance in a country. Hey, what's going on? You know, you know, I've heard we've got this going on there. You know, what do you think about that? Just to make sure we're all communicating with each other, because I have seen times where, you know, somebody has that knowledge, but not everybody in the company who should know knows about it. So just making sure we're all communicating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I would add to both kind of relates to Muhammad and Tracy's comment in terms of the education piece, and that is we then periodically then would take, you know, whatever the, the issue, may, which may see be, be seemingly unrelated in the country that you're in, right? The compliance issue, you think, well, that's unrelated, or we don't have to do, worry about that. But um, we have our people that, hey, make a presentation, have a, you know, what are the issues that you've learned about? and educate the rest of the organization. And in doing so, again, it goes back to even our first question about cross-cultural. It helps us understand the different cultures, what they might be dealing with a socio-political element, and then also just helps, um, uh, again, create uh, platforms for that shared knowledge that Muhammad was speaking of. Great, thank you for that. And our next question is, what are some of the ways to build cross-culturally collaboration, especially in a hybrid or virtual organization? And I'm going to start out with John on this question. I mean, again, one of the things we're doing right now is certainly part of it, right? Because we're all used to these uh, meetings and these things. One of the things, and I'm sure many of you, you as companies have social platforms, some version of some organization that's uh, sold you on their engagement platform. Uh, we're not uh, recommending vendors today, but I, I would say that, yeah, you're using some form. So we really use that to tell stories. And the people, the, just like on uh, Facebook or some other tool like that, people want to hear their stories. And we think telling the stories, either video stories or those things that are going on uh, in those other countries and then sharing them. And then the just the very basic things that are celebrating, you know, celebrating birthdays and celebrating those things across uh, those things help again build those relational dynamics that make for a good business. Uh, and and as we do those things, we found that when you build strong networks of relationships, the communication and all the other things to do the day to day business just goes so much faster and easier. So um, and then the only uh, well the other thing I think I'll share till uh, one of our later questions that we do to try to to build that cross-cultural element, but use your social platforms and then really work them. Great. Tracy, what about you? Um, some of the things that, you know, try to do within my own team is, you know, give them an opportunity to highlight something, you know, that's unique to either their local business, right? Or, you know, what's going on in their country or, or culture, some sort of, you know, festival or festivities. So not every meeting is just, okay, let's get down to business, you know, like, let's talk a little bit, hey, what's going on? You know, it was Lunar New Year. What did you guys do in Singapore? Um, it just, you know, I think it facilitates friendships, quite frankly, among the team, um, even though we're, we're global and um, a lot of us never get to, you know, meet together. Um, so I have found that that's, you know, it's just kind of a nice way to make sure we're all, um, you know, doing more than just talking about the numbers. Exactly. Mohammed, what about you? Uh, so I would say, like, when living in the hybrid world today, we've really, whether you're leading a team nationally or, or more so globally, those borders have gone down and the collaboration has been completely disrupted. One thing that we've done at Dow Jones that has proven to be successful is, um, and bringing global co collaboration to life is we're, we're rallying around project initiatives based around the strategic priorities um, of our people organization. It's allowed the team to work together, um, you know, regardless of time zones, and it's on really impactful work, having them rally together around a common purpose and mission. Um, we have found this to be successful. Uh, we did this um, across the, uh, the HR business partner function and our uh, talent acquisition function globally, um, and the work that came out of that, uh, we've emulated across 
um, other parts of uh, our HRCOE. So uh, it has been a proven method to, to, to come around these strategic priorities and projects. So um, a, a little different, but I want to take some of that fun that Tracy is doing as well, too. I think that that is just critical as well. And Dev, what about you? Yeah, I would just really quickly underscore what, what John talked about. And this is some of what we're doing at GP. You know, we have such diverse workforces in so many different places around the world, utilizing all kinds of channels to send messages out that will appeal to different sorts of uh, diverse teams is important, whether it's video, email snippets, cartoons, graphics, et cetera, but really hitting those different channels through different technology modes to appeal and get the message across is so important. So we have a question from the audience and um, let's see who can answer this. Our global team is struggling to maintain even a very basic level of trust. We had an employee steal a non-trivial amount of money from the company and now the rest of the company have kind of written off this his entire country team. Mm. Do you have any advice for us? Hmm. Yeah, well, I, if I could share again, and many of you know the book uh, by the Stephen Covey, Speed of Trust. That book is a fantastic, it's uh, it's been out for a long time, but I think the, the one key takeaway from how you build trust or rebuild trust from my vantage point is declaration of intent. And so again, I think to get that that team to reaffirm their declaration of intent to bring value, de de declaring as it relates to helping them to articulate these team members who are left or who are trying to overcome this impact. Um, and then my other thing would be to find an ally out of the larger group uh, in other words, find an ally in another part of the organization and 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 uh, align themselves in such a way where you have some off just individual conversations so that when you come to a larger group meeting, that ally can, you know, speak to the, hey, here's what they're trying to do. I know I can speak to their credibility, uh, their organization. And you could ask an individual, hey, would you give a word, a shout out to me? Uh, uh, you know, whereas you're not going to do that in a group, but you could have an individual back conversation uh, to, to drive that. Uh, and because really, we all need third party credibility. We need to have somebody say to us, hey, they know what they're doing. Because uh, none of us can, with humility, do that. That sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Anybody else want to answer that? Add anything? I guess I would just add, you know, kind of similar to, to my example is you have to rebuild that trust. You have to figure that out, right? And it shouldn't just even be about a, a country, right? We've all worked with various departments throughout our career. And we, we shouldn't be writing off an entire department because of an error that one person made. So mm -hmm. we, we should really first unpack that a little bit. Um, so I would do that as an organization, right? It's it's not even just about a country. It's like you, you don't write off, um, you know, a whole uh, department or Okay, I don't want to get into race. This isn't about race, but a whole race because of you know the, the the of what one individual does. But what I would do in this situation is I would rebuild that trust. I would find ways to collaborate with the employees of that country uh, around the common mission or a common goal, project, etc. Um, to to rebuild that trust because it it has to be able to work. And I think there will be some really good lessons learned there. Thank yeah, you. I would I would agree with um, Muhammad on focusing on why like the group who is not, you know, um, who is distrusting like the rest of the employees left in this country. Why are they you know, why are they doing that? I think we've all had, you know, issues that have come up where, you know, one employee sort of went rogue and, you know, it hasn't uh, spilled over to the rest of the team. So, you know, focusing on why now, you know, the rest of the country is being written off by the rest of the, the company, I think is really important. And then, you know, as both John and Muhammad were saying, you know, somebody really stepping in there to, you know, support that team, you know, the employees left in the country and really showcasing them, right? And, and why this group, you know, why we believe in them and why they're going to move forward and maybe giving them a high profile project. Mm. And I think we have time for one more question. It's in, in the same theme of what we're, we've been talking about. Many of our self, software developers live in Ukraine and are going through some really hellish experiences. What can we do to support them? Everything I can think of seems completely inadequate. Hmm. Wow. Yep. You know, I mean, I'd be, I'd be happy to kind of jump into this one. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah. I'm sure everyone's going to have some good ideas. You know, I, I think it starts with a bit of 
authenticity and real talk and just sort of like sharing how we're feeling about this. And, and the fact that, you know, countries are stepping in to help Ukraine. So things that individuals or organizations can do will feel inadequate and maybe that's okay. That doesn't mean that nothing should be done. And then there's a whole host of things, right? There's, you know, crowdfunding, there's, you know, all of those sorts of things, well wishes, et cetera, volunteering that can then come in from that. But I feel like, you know, the, the underlying piece here is that it's not that it's inadequate. I think just even the, the vocal support could be seen as being very, very supportive. John, apologies, I think I-, I No, think no, I, no, that's okay. Again, we had a plant uh, for a while in Slovakia. So again, I'm very close to that area. In fact, we built some great relationships there. And, and I would just kind of build off the of dev, you know, partnering in this type of event. There's so many organizations that are going in and 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 to find some a, a partner somewhere that then asking simply the question, you know, and I don't uh, what is that best help? What is that support that that individual in the Ukraine needs is first off. And then second, who do you know? Or who do you know that who knows somebody who's in the who's in a neighboring country? I have a personal friend who goes in on a regular basis into Slovakia, all or from Slovakia into the Ukraine, still taking food, medical supplies, other things, and and so there are numbers of those kinds of organizations. And then there's people on the outside, even in the Czech Republic. A friend of mine who I've developed with um, has uh, over three thousand folks who've moved out. So those relationship connections are there. And supports are there, and they're actually they're really small communities that re they get small really fast. And so, I, again, if there's somebody who wants to reach out to me directly, I'd be glad to try to help in any way that I can. Thank you, John. All right, so let's keep going on with our questions. Um, are there any special concerns around hiring global talent? And Deb, we're going to start with you on this one. Yeah, this is a this is a great question. So the, the the first thing I think about is it's global talent, but is the remit local, regional, or global? Let's assume for a second it's global talent with a global remit. Then yes, there absolutely are some very specific considerations. I think really understanding how this person is qualified and has demonstrated the ability to manage all of the things we've just been talking about for the past 15, 20 minutes. How do you think about the cross-cultural? How do you think about time zones? How do you think about regulatory um, requirements in, you know, in different countries? And what I'll typically do with my interview panel is make sure that we've got some very specific questions, depending on the role, in terms of actually seeing demonstrable capabilities in these areas. I think, you know, we have a um, responsibility to candidates that we're bringing into our organizations to make sure that they're set up for success with the sorts of experiences and the sorts of um, skills that you know, we're gonna need in the role. Thank you. Tracy. Um, I think uh, jumping on what Deb said, I think it's really important to you know understand you know is this role supporting you know in country and you know in region or is it really a global role? Um, and you know, and I think the answer to that, right, will you know kind of inform, you know, the type of talent you need, um, you know, does it make sense for this role in this area, you know, can they really, are we setting them up for success if they're supporting a global team from where they are? Um, I think these are really critical decisions that we need to make on the, you know, as we're hiring um, to make sure that, you know, we are setting them up for success in these global roles, because there's a lot to manage. Um, especially, you know, there's great things about working remote, but, you know, some of there's also challenges sometimes, right? Like you're, you, know, you have to build the relationships remotely, which, um, you know, can sometimes, maybe not always, but sometimes a little bit more difficult than, you know, when we're all in one office. So I do always think about that, you know, what is this role actually going to be focusing on? Thank you, Tracy. Mohammed. Uh, yeah, very similar to Tracy and Dev. It, it's really about a global mindset, right? And and to be able to figure that out, I, I do agree. It, it has to happen with the interview process. And, and one of the things that we've done here at Dow Jones is really creating a structured interview process um, that is helping us define what it means to have a global mindset and asking those key questions to ensure that um, Yes, we have the skills and, and we have the capabilities and, and the expertise within the country or within the region, um, but how can we transfer that globally as well too, so that 
the employee, whether they're in Singapore, you know, if how can they transcend that into the US or into Hong Kong? Um, so it's having that mindset, but being able to capture that um, at the interview stage is, is critical and important. Don? The only thing I'd add to what uh, to build on what Mama was saying was simply uh, that it, for everyone who has, uh, uh, well, to build on the earlier, Dev had talked about the, the multicultural work site that you're at already, wherever you are geographically, it's already multi multicultural, we hope. Right. And so you're already dealing with that. And so but then when you talk about the geographical boundaries that are, again, have been limited or knocked down some by our, our remote work, uh, it's not as big an issue where you're sitting. And so then it goes back to the mindset point, uh, because somebody has uh, has to have their first global role, I would say. Right. Uh, all of us had, you know, I hadn't had that exposure at some point. It was your first role. And so I think it is more about uh, certain experiences necessary, but it's mindset uh, and, and that learner mindset with his listening skills that Muhammad was alluding to that I think are absolutely critical uh, to help grow that, that global mindset and global talent. And we do have a question from the audience. What do you wish you'd known at the beginning of your work managing global teams? I wish I'd have known Spanish or Chinese. <laughs> Yeah, like a number of languages would definitely help. <laughs> Either one of those would have been really helpful. I, I, I'll also just throw out that, um, you know, I wish I, and I've learned this now, and it's, it's, I think it's made a critical difference for me, but it's not about me trying to get everybody else, you know, to understand what the company, sort of like the corporate, right, uh, company wants to do. It's really about me understanding, you know, what what works for them, and you know, working together to kind of reach that goal. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the beginning, and I think a lot, you know, I don't want to speak for you know everybody, but I think sometimes it's okay. We need to get everybody else to adapt to what we're trying to do, and sometimes it just does not work, and it's never going to work, and you're never going to be successful doing that if that's your approach. So I had that mindset going in. I've completely changed, and it's made me so much better at my job that I've accepted that. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Anyone else have anything before we move on to our next question? You know, maybe just adding on to what, what Tracy said, absolutely, localization is key. Um, I wish I had just, like, somebody had told me, never assume you know. Mm -hmm. Like, ask the question, because so much of what we think and we know and just our thinking process is impacted by the culture that we live in. Right. And those things can be fundamentally different from one place to another. So I think for me, just, you know, never assume. Thank you, Dev. All right. Next question up is how do you handle onboarding in a remote first world? And we can start with Tracy again here. Sure. You know, in this is an area where I feel like things have equalized a bit uh, since COVID because we were, you know, um, you know, more office based. Um, and now everybody like we've, we're hiring all over the world remotely, including in the US, uh, which is our largest employee population. So, you know, sort of bringing together people remotely, it's not just the people who aren't in the US anymore. It's really, it's, it's everywhere. So I feel like we've gotten better at that because now we're really, you know, it's just, we're going to a much larger um, base of our employee population remotely. And Mohammed. I mean, similar to Tracy, I, you know, we have an opportunity right now, right? To really create experiences around onboarding that is felt globally, right? And immersing um, each one of the employees into the culture of the company. But I also think you have to balance it um, with, it's not a one size fits all either as well too, right? There are many different nuances, um, quite frankly, even here in the US, state to state, right? And um, understanding the different cultural norms and um, you know what is expected of the employee for that region or for that country is gonna be critical as well too. So creating an, a, a robust overall onboarding experience um, so that the employees feel it, um, whether they're in APAC or EMEA or here in the Americas, um, but then honing in and realizing that there are some important critical pieces 
for their own region that that we should be tending to and caring to as well too. So um, it, it's it's broader than just what the company onboarding it is. We should think about the onboarding for that region as well too. Thank you, Mohammed. Dev. You know, I think like probably most people um, on the call, the onboarding experience typically pre-COVID was everybody meets regionally for two or three days, goes through all of these things, and that you know that's it, right? And for me at the places I worked for the first year or so of COVID, it was like, all right, how do we replicate that with this technology, you know, with video? And coming out of that, what we learned was that actually there are some things we can do better in the remote environment, which is bringing everyone together on their first three days of a company for three days of solid learning actually isn't the best way to absorb and learn, right? But now we're not dealing with, you know, the budgets of travel, et cetera, and time to cram everything into three days. So you can, you, you can, you can split things out more into snippets and you can think about how do we take advantage of remote and where we are now versus seeing it as being a sort of disadvantage. And those are some of the learnings that we took out of the first year or so of COVID. And I feel now in, you know, in many ways from a learning effectiveness standpoint, the onboarding and the new hire training that like, you know, we do at GP, for instance, is actually stronger now than it was before. That's great, Deb. Thank you for sharing that. John? I'm just going to give four words, standardize heart and localize color which is, and I mean color commentary, like you listen to on a, on a, on a sports cast, right? Uh, so the standardized heart simply sim means, right, the heart of the organization, wherever that's being driven from, that has to be standardized so that there's the same message all over the globe. And then localiz the localization is that the color commentary that makes it unique about that location or that group of people who are gathered in that particular place. And even if that particular place is a remote place, that is a place in and of itself. So those are, that's all I would add. Thank you, John. And one of our last questions is, what are some ways to uniform your global workforce around the common goals and common values? And Mo, you're gonna start us off with this question. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that we, we've done at Dow Jones is really listen to our employees to truly understand uh, when we were rolling out our values to them, what is it? What does it actually mean to them? Um, and that's very critical, not only just um, within you know where the majority of the employees are, but we have to listen to them globally. So what we did is we did localized uh, global focus groups to understand what each value meant to them, and what that in turn did it allowed us to balance these values globally and really create those salient points on what these values meant and embed them across every part of our employee experience, um, as well as the life cycle of an employee at Dow Jones. Um, so it's a really core part of our culture here. Um, and we would have missed the boat if we really didn't listen to what our employees um, said and what it meant to them um, at a global scale. Great. That's great. John? Uh, I think the probably the the biggest tip that I have is we have an, uh, one, our, one of our core values is serve people. And we believe that people all over the world and every culture are happiest when they truly serve one another with their hands and with their, and so we create partner local organizations and we give every uh, person on the globe two days a year in addition to all their other benefits where they can go serve. We create events internally that we bring in to serve, whether it's food preparation or a food bank or supporting backpacks for kids in, in need or glasses for some local regional group of kids. Uh, and then get, getting people serving in that way. And that, that is the greatest unifier. Then we once a year give out uh, submitted by the people uh, from that region their, their Servants Heart Award. And, um, and, and as a result of that, those are all recognized globally at a one annual meeting. It's, it's kind of the, the annual global town hall. And we recognize that Servants Heart Award and, and it's one for each location that we exist in. That's great. Thank you, John. Tracy. Yeah, actually, we do something similar to what John does, and, and I think it has a huge positive impact across the company. We, um, uh, you know, McGraw-Hill, it's Red Cube Cares, which is our community service outreach. But, you know, each office th throughout the world will, they'll have their own project, right? And then they post about it on our internet. Um, and then we have, you know, Global Volunteer Week and we give service days. And it really is something that even though each, you know, region, each country, they're doing something that's, you know, relevant and appropriate for them. 
we're all doing something, you know, community outreach, community service. So I think it, you know, it's a, it's a great way to bring everybody together um, around one, one mission and one goal. Wow. That's great. Devin. I mean, Deb, sorry. Destroying your name, yeah. giving you a new one. <laughs> We've had, um, I, I think maybe I like Devin. Um, you know, I mean, great, great ideas from, from all of the other panelists. Um, you know, I would say, and, and this has been talked about, linking and labeling, because it's one thing to have the values, to communicate them, to make them resonate, and then to do things around those values. But then linking and labeling and reminding folks globally with local stories, local examples, that look, we are actually driving this day to day is so important because I found that folks can feel kind of separated sometimes from what the company values are. And that linking and labeling is really important in my mind. All great answers. Thank you. It's all about unity and getting people together. And so I appreciate that. We have a couple of questions from our audience. And so let's see if I can make sure I cover them here. Um, what's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in trying to build a high functioning global team? How did they get past it? Hmm. Somebody wanted to answer that question? Yeah, I, I think the biggest mistake is just sort of taking like a, you know, you know, it, whether it's U.S. or a different country, like a U.S. centric approach and just trying to export that throughout the world. I think it's a huge mistake and it, it doesn't really work. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, Tracy, because my head went exactly to the same place what you were talking about. Then the second mistake I've seen companies make after they realize that was a mistake is hire a strong local leader and expect them to operate the way that that the mothership operates. Right? Exactly. Go back to what Muhammad was saying earlier, and he talked about asking and listening to the people is the, my my converse to that was be not asking. You know, uh, thinking, you know, and assuming instead of asking enough questions to really uh, uh, get out of folks, because, yeah, just asking enough questions. Mohammed, anything you want to add? I, yeah, similar. It's, it's not a one size fits all. It can't be right. I mean, you know, us as human beings are, are interesting. Right. So like even even nationally, you, you have to think about where they are on the journey. Um, so globally, you have to do that as well, too, um, and 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 just make peace with it isn't a one size fits all and just understand how you can bring them along on the journey. We have another question. Our parent company is overseas and they don't have a lot of respect for American culture, particularly around guns. They make. Oh, let's see if I can see that make. Oh, this is in my way. Sorry. Of critical comments. Um, which are wearing us out. Do you have any advice for us? Sounds like they're making comments. Any advice around that one? And again, I can repeat it if you'd like, but it's a, it's a company overseas that don't have a lot of respect for the American culture, especially around guns. I would say don't assume, right? I think that's been kind of the, the theme here, right? It's making assumptions that they understand how it's making it feel on you know, the, the American workforce, right? Um, and the impacts that that might have on productivity, um, you know, if you have data around it, right? If you, you feel like that there's turnover and it was attributed to that and you could find that either through um, your attrition data or through, you know, the, what's happening in the exit interviews, if you feel like that is an acute problem for that. But I would, I would say, again, don't assume that they know how, um, what they're communicating around a certain topic is uh, impacting your workforce. Anyone else want to add anything before we move to the next question? All right, we have another one. We are having a very difficult time getting our tax registration done in one of the countries where we operate. Our local fixer says that the tax authorities want a bribe. What should we do? I mean, honestly, that's very serious. I, you know, if you have an in-house lawyer, you should go to them immediately. Um, yeah, because it can turn into a huge issue. Uh, you need to be really careful here. I, I'm not trying to say the house is on fire, but, you know, when you hear the word bribe as a company, you've got to really figure out what's going on there. Yeah, and I would say you should change your local council immediately. Yeah, uh, that, that's that. My first thing is, yeah, I'd, I'd look for multiple counselors in, in, in the in multiple ways. And what we do in all, some of those countries where that is part of the culture, uh, we have two or three, and many times it costs more, but we have two or three advisors to compare against 
right? And um, and then convey uh, that's not how we do business. So um, and we it it's probably cost us more in the long run, but the bribe would have cost you something anyway. So so that's just not the way to do business, and you just got to be upfront with it. Yeah, I mean, just just one thing I'd add. I mean, you know, we operate in 180 countries around the world, and it is unusual that this is the only way to get something done. So I would definitely get more, better, different local counsel to figure out. And if it is the only way to get something done, which I, I don't think would be the case, then it's probably the wrong country to operate in. Hmm. Looks like we have one more question. How do you think global HR compliance is going to evolve over the next couple of years? I, I, I would say my guess is it's going to get even more complicated um, and uh, it's going to become more time consuming. And I think as companies, we're going to have to dedicate more resources to this as we, you know, if we want to continue to operate globally. Um, it's just, I think I see, you know, in you know developing countries, more focus on employment regulations. Um, you know, I think they're, you know, uh, certain countries are more developed, but the developing countries are getting there. And it's going to be harder and harder to, to operate if you don't know what you're doing and what you need to be doing to be compliant. Thank yeah, you, Tracy. Maybe add on to what Tracy was just saying. I think that we're seeing some regions come together and some groups of countries come together with pretty deep, strict laws, but at least they're similar. Right. But then we're also seeing other countries start to diverge. So so I think it's going to get more complicated in two different dimensions, more variety as, as well as more depth. So it's it's going to get harder in a bunch of different ways. Thank you, Dev. We have one more question, it looks like. Now we have a program that rotates promising young leaders through a series of international positions. Some of these positions are much more physically comfortable than others. And it can be very hard to get people to leave more comfortable posts for less comfortable posts. Any thoughts that could keep the flow of people through posts going? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any experience with that. So I have nothing to add. So sorry about that. I would say, can you do it so that you do the, the least comfortable posts first and then just keep you know, increasing the comfort level through the rotation? The only practical thing I can think of. I I would just add I would tie it into part of the learning path and tie it into why it's important to go through, um, you know, being uncomfortable and tie it into like you should get uncomfortable in your career and yes it's physical but um, how does that tie to the company's mission and overall uh, strategic goals over the next few years um, as well as you know the skill sets that they're going to build within those particular. Um, you know, posts uh, that they may not in the other ones. So that's how I would do it. No, it's a good point, Muhammad. And again, a lot of people like career pathing. And so maybe if you build it in as a career pathing, then maybe they'll know to expect it. And maybe they don't accept the position if they know that there's some tough stuff in the middle there somewhere. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn it back over to Eric. Thank you, panel, for that insightful panel discussion. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thanks very much. Thanks, all. Bye, everyone. Bye.